All right, thanks, Marty. Um, we'll just sort of switch gears here a little bit and start from, uh, start from the beginning a little bit. So, um, you know, we're going to focus on just the general principles of the pediatric trauma patient, but obviously we're going to look at more of the orthopedic principles rather than the general surgical or the general uh, trauma principles. It's important for all of us, um, especially for us uh, uh, more adult surgeons who don't necessarily treat a lot of pediatric fractures, although we do see a, a fair amount, that we have a basic understanding of the general care of these uh, pediatric trauma patients because um, um, even though we may not uh, see them, you know, for the rest of their lives, it's important that uh, we, we know what to be cognizant of to uh, keep us out of trouble. So I thought the way we'd do it is just talk about the basic uh, epidemiology of uh, pediatric fractures. We'll talk about, you know, what makes kids a little bit different than adults, right? So the pediatric polytrauma patient, even though some of the principles are very similar, there are unique um, and some distinct characteristics that we need to be aware of when we talk about um, children's injuries. And then, of course, um, you know, basic management principles. One thing that struck me when I was, uh, you know, preparing for this is just how common these uh, fractures are in kids. I mean, by the age of 16, 40% uh, of males and 25% of females will have some type of fracture, which is actually pretty staggering. And I think um, one of the reasons that the properties of this immature skeleton are, are different. I mean, they have different characteristics. The complications are different. We just heard a great talk by Dr. Kozen, um, you know, that we don't necessarily see in the adult population. Um, and then the management of these complications are, are a little bit different. So, um, you know, most commonly these uh, fractures are seen in the distal forearm and the wrist, only uh, followed second by the uh, clavicle. You guys think, that, especially the residents, when you guys graduate from residency, you'll never have to see a stress strain curve ever again. But uh, I think if, if you look at this, it gives you a general understanding of what makes children's bones a little bit different than adults. I mean, in the adult population, there's natural, you know, an actual ultimate yield strength where after you apply a certain load to a fracture, it's going to fail and you get, you know, cortical disruption and, uh, you know, they, they, it, it breaks. But in, in kids, you can have increased strain in an immature bone that doesn't necessarily cause it to catastrophically fail. And this concept, you know, all of us are familiar with is this area of uh, plastic deformation where, you know, even though you're applying a load, the bone is bending, and in theory, we still call it a fracture, but there's no cortical disruption. So again, these are just a couple of schematics just, uh, you know, showing uh, uh, pictures of what, uh, you know, the curve was trying to depict. So you can see the, the bone on the I guess your left side of the screen, um, you know, it's bent. It's not, it's not necessarily uh, um, any evidence of cortical disruption, but you can see that all of us would, would, uh, would still refer to it as a fracture, right? And then, of course, on the right side are just your stereotypical um, cortical uh, buckle injuries. The top one, obviously, is the wrist, and the bottom one is at the right at the metaphyseal diaphyseal junction. Another um, issue that makes the pediatric uh, trauma patients a, a little bit different is their ability to remodel and the ability for overgrowth. So these, these fractures in general heal more rapidly in the pediatric population. But even once they're healed, they have a tremendous ability to sort of look normal again later in life, right? So, uh, you know, even in my practice, we have a lot of uh, kids with these displaced proxyhumerous fractures. And, you know, we were always taught, as, you know, taught by Dr. Herman also that, you know, majority of these do very well. You don't necessarily have to jump on all of these and, and, uh, and fix them. And you can just see in this uh, depiction that, um, you know, they, they remodel quite well, almost, almost looking normal. And the, the factors that affect the remodeling potential of these injuries, of course, are patient's age, the plane of the deformity relation to the joint. So um, just what Dr. Kozen said earlier, you know, for wrist fractures, the, the deformity tends to correct a little bit better in the sagittal plane than rather in the coronal planes. Again, deformity proximal to the physis tends to remodel a little bit easier. And then of course, the uh, growth potential at the particular physis. So the physis and the knees are a little bit more uh, active than, say, the, the, um, the, uh, the proximal femur. Accelerated growth is most commonly, or um, it's easier seen, I guess, uh, in the da and daphseal femur models. So in um, daphseal femur fractures, in this case, uh, transverse femur fracture in, in a pediatric patient treated with elastic nails, you can see that uh, once they're healed, they tend to uh, lengthen. So even shortening up to two centimeters can sometimes be corrected. Some of uh, the reasoning for this have been attributed to the hyperemia effect. So, you know, as fractures break, increased blood flow to heal the fracture. Once the fractures are healed, the bone gets stimulated and can sometimes uh, overgrowth. 
Again, physeal injury, so um, something that I think all of us in this room are acutely aware of, what makes these uh, uh, patients a little bit different than our adult counterparts. 20% of uh, pediatric fractures are associated with the physis, so it peaks usually in the adolescent age group. So ch children who are between the age of, say, like 8 to, to 14, you're seeing more of these uh, physeal injuries. However, the incidence of growth arrest and growth disturbance are not as common. So um, the reports have shown anywhere from 1 to 10%, which um, is a lot lower than what I would initially have thought. So all of us should be familiar with the, uh, you know, uh, Salter Harris classification. I left this slide on here just for the residents in the room. If you can't remember the actual um, uh, way to remember, there's a little mnemonic which basically shows, I don't know if this works, you can see here. Um, for Salter Harris, uh, one fractures, it's straight across, Salter Harris two, it's above, three, it's uh, below, two is uh, two and through, and then the fives are obviously uh, uh, the, 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 comp the crush of the growth plate. So switching gears a little bit, so wh what do we do in the multiply injured pediatric patients? So the initial assessment is very similar to that of the adult population, right? You want to start off with your basics, so your ABCs, your airway breathing and circulation. Usually in, the, in a trauma-based setting, per se, you know, we as orthopedists tend to, you know, focus on the extremities, obviously, and usually these things are going concurrently with our uh, friends on the trauma team where they're securing their airway uh, uh, and um, uh, assessing their breathing and circulation. The pediatric, um, the, or, or PALS, uh, is obviously in effect. And again, it's, re it's important to remember that children are not small adults. So, I mean, that's the first thing when my residency that, uh, that was, uh, you know, told to me that you, you can't treat these children necessarily just like their adult counterparts because their physiology is a little bit different than, or I should say vastly different than, than the uh, uh, adult population. You know, an injury insult may not manifest as quickly as you would see in, in an adult. Hemodynamic instability may not occur until 20 to 30 percent of their blood volume is lost. There's different uh, pediatric trauma scoring systems that are used um, in, in the adult trauma world. We commonly use the ISS, and just to quickly go over it, there's six body regions, the head and neck, face, chest, abdomen, extremity, and external, external meaning um, the skin. Um, the each are assigned an AIS score, and the top three AIS scores are squared and then added. Anything above a 16 is considered polytrauma, the highest score being um, 75. The pediatric trauma score, I think, is used a little bit uh, more commonly, actually, in, in the pediatric world. And again, it's, um, it's a little bit easier. They look at weight, airway, systolic blood pressure, level of consciousness, the presence of fracture, and any cutaneous injuries. And again, it's scored from plus one all the way to, to minus one. And anything uh, above an eight should have a zero percent uh, mortality. And obviously, anything in between um, would help us to, uh, uh, measure morbidity and mortality. Uh, the pediatric Glasgow Comer Scale is a little bit different than in the, uh, in the adults. Uh, in, in terms of eye opening, they break it down at one year of age um, in, uh, and also in, uh, excuse me, motor response as well. Whereas in the, in the verbal response, clearly um, kids are, you know, not necessarily uh, can answer yet at such a young age, but usually by age five, um, excuse me, by, by age five they're usually um, conversing as adults, whereas two to five and less than uh, two years of age, there's a different scoring scheme for them. No, um, you know, this is something that obviously, you know, all of us, even in the adult world, need to be very, very cognizant about because, I mean, we have to be these uh, children's advocates. Sometimes they can't, you know, um, help themselves. So one to two percent of all children are, are abused annually, and that's something, you know, we just need to stick in the back of our head, and it's something we need to be aware about. Younger children are the ones who are uh, more at risk, and, you know, especially after skin lesions, fractures actually are the ones that, uh, our most common physical manifestation for child abuse, um, especially in the femoral shaft, hand and feet fractures, and, and non-ambulatory non uh, babies. Spiral fractures or fractures of the femur, non-ambulatory patients, like I said, are sometimes considered um, uh, not necessarily uh, pathognomonic, but, but uh, high risk. Corner fractures, injuries at the metaphyseal diaphyseal junction at the, um, at the tibia or, or, or distal femur, and of course, posterior rib fractures in uh, different stages of healing are sometimes considered pathognomonic. Um, spinal cord injury uh, without a radiographic abnormality overwhelmingly is seen in the pediatric population, 15 to 35 percent. Um, of spinal cord injuries don't have necessarily evidence of pathology on basic radiographic x-rays, but most will have um, findings on, on MRIs. And again, this is attributed to the differences between the pediatric skeleton versus the adult. And the pediatric skeleton, the spinal column is obviously much more um, elastic uh, 
Predisposing factors include uh, the cervical spine hypermobility, ligamentous laxity, and of course the immature vascular blood supply to the spinal cord. Um, just finishing up, in pediatric pelvic fractures are broken down um, very simply in terms of one through four, the Tarot and Z classification. One is obviously being most associated, or the one being associated with the least morbidity and all the way up to four associated with higher morbidity and even mortality. So type one are the apophyseal injuries. So the ones that you're having either muscles pull off the ASIS, AIS, or the uh, ischial tuberosities. Type twos are, are, are unicortical uh, uh, iliac wing fractures where they're not necessarily uh, through and through. Type three are stable pelvic ring injuries and type four obviously unstable pelvic ring injuries. Um, just uh, finishing up in general, again the principles of damage control orthopedics apply. We're not, not necessarily going to go through all that right now, but again it's the initial, stabilization, initial stabilization of these kids that's important. You don't necessarily have to fix everything all at once um, at the same time. Neurovascular exam and compromise is important to avoid some of the things that Dr. Cozen just showed us. Open fractures, again, excisional debridement, bony stabilization, examination of the soft tissues. Um, and again, in most kids, close reduction casting is usually the, uh, the um, gold standard for treating of, of most injuries. You know, for the residents out there, if you ever have a question, you have no idea, just pick the close reduction option. Usually you'll be safe. And again, the ABCs come first. Thanks.